So it is my pleasure to introduce Professor Dwight Reynolds, who will be well known to many of us here. Um, he is currently Professor of Arabic Language and Literature in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Since earning his PhD from the University of Pennsylvania, Professor Reynolds has held positions at Harvard, Princeton, and UC Santa Barbara, where he, he is now. His research spans medieval and modern Arabic literature, folklore, and ethnomusicology, with a particular focus on the musical traditions of Al-Andalus. His notable uh, publications include the monographs, Heroic Poets, Poetic Heroes, The Ethnography of Performance in an Arabic Oral Epic Tradition, Arab Folklore, a handbook, the musical heritage of Al-Andalus, of course, is the basis of this talk today, as well as the forthcoming medieval Arab music and musicians. He's also edited and co-authored publications, including Interpreting the Self, Autobiography in the Arabic Literary Tradition, The Cambridge Companion to Modern Arab Culture, and The Garland Encyclopedia of World Music, Volume 6 on the Middle East. Now, this afternoon, we are here to celebrate the publication of Professor Reynolds' new book, The Musical Heritage of Al-Andalus. And we're delighted to be able to share, and I'm gonna do this now via share screen, um, a 20% discount flyer um, from Routledge. Um, you'll see the code there on the flyer. So do please take advantage of this um, to, um, to get a discount on Dwight's book. So just a little introduction to the book. Um, this long-awaited text offers a critical account of the history of Andalusian music in Iberia from the Islamic conquest of 711 to the final expulsion of, Mod of the Moriscos, who were Spanish Muslims converted to Christianity in the early 17th century. This volume presents the documentation that has come down to us accompanied by critical and detailed analyses of the sources written in Arabic, Old Catalan, Castilian, Hebrew and Latin. It's also informed by research that Professor Reynolds has conducted on modern Andalusian musical traditions in Morocco, Algeria, Tunisia, Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria. While the cultural achievements of medieval Muslim Spain have been the topic of a large number of scholarly and popular publications in recent decades, what may arguably, arguably be its most enduring contribution, that is music, has been almost entirely neglected. The overarching purpose of this book then is to elucidate the many different types of musical interactions that took place in medieval Iberia and the complexity of the various borrowings, adaptations, hybridizations, and appropriations involved. So I would like now to pass over to Dwight Reynolds. Matthew, thank you very much for a kind introduction. As you said, I'm here in California, so good morning. It's 8 a.m. This is the earliest I've ever given a formal lecture or presentation, um, although I oftentimes do Arabic verbs this early in the morning with uh, suffering students in my Arabic language classes. Um, thank you for the invitation. It is a pleasure to speak to you all, and uh, thanks all of you for uh, attending in whatever time zone you may be. Um, what I'm hoping to do is talk for just about 10 minutes about this book that has just come out, which is the part, part one of a two-part project um, that also has a third supplementary volume. I'll tell you about the overall project, um, just speaking to you, and then I will shift to a PowerPoint and speak more directly to the question, the theme of the broader project, and that is musical encounters, um, music across and around the Western Mediterranean. So this book, I, th I think, is almost an accidental book. It was meant to be the introductory chapter to a book on modern Andalusian traditions. Uh, as many of you know, this is a, we refer to it as, as Andalusian music because it is tied to, the, to Al Andalus, the Arab word for medieval Muslim Spain or medieval Moorish Spain. I first encountered this music when I was studying as an undergraduate studying in Cairo, when I took Oud lessons and Middle Eastern music lessons, Arab music lessons, all of my teachers constantly directed me to Mouachahat, the genre of song that we know from this tradition as the primary examples of the old authentic modal system and rhythmic system. <clears throat> Later, I was lucky enough to travel to Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, Lebanon, and Syria, 
Um, one branch of the tradition that I have never been able to explore very sadly is Yemen. I really wish that I had been able to visit Yemen before the, the troubles of the last decade and a half or so. Um, but there is a wonderful branch of this tradition there. And once I began getting this larger picture of the modern traditions, I sat down to research what I see what I could find about the medieval tradition before it spread or as it spread across the Arabic speaking Middle East. And I found almost nothing in English. In fact, the last book to be published on this topic in English is a book that was published in the 1920s that itself is a translation and abridgment of two books by uh, Julian Rivera y Targon um, that were put together and sort of mashed together in a funny English volume. And what I found in Spanish and French and Arabic was, was not very satisfactory. It all seemed very fragmented and it seemed to sort of replicate ideas without having double checked them against the original sources. And while I was working on all of this, I had a wonderful opportunity, and that is that the University of California has a study center in Granada, Spain, and I was appointed as director of that center for three years, which gave me wonderful access to the Escuela de Estudios Árabes and to the Center of Musical Documentation of Andalusia in uh, Granada, and also to colleagues there and colleagues up in the Thesic and different Spanish universities. And that really allowed me to sort of dig in and rummage around in all of the material that I had been looking for and not finding, at least in English language scholarship. And the more I dug and rummaged around, the more I realized that there were many new sources that had not yet been incorporated into the musical history of Iberia. Uh, scattered, it's not as if there were one, there was one large book, but rather smaller texts or references, sometimes even just short passages that were very important, but hadn't been incorporated into our larger vision of music in medieval Iberia and the Western Mediterranean. So I pulled together as much as I could, and I worked with scholars who helped me go through the you know, original texts in Arabic, Hebrew, Castilian, Latin, and Old Catalan, because there are excellent uh, resources in all of those languages. And I want to thank all of the colleagues who helped me work my way through the, the original source material, because that was a very, very important part of this uh, process. One of the things that I discovered is that Many, in many cases, people had not gone back to the original sources in quite a while. I found these fascinating sort of games of telephone where, say, a 19th century working from one manuscript of a text had summarized or translated a passage loosely, and that had gotten trans moved into modern scholarship, and then one scholar citing another changed it a little, changed it a little, changed it a little, until some of the claims that are floating around about medieval Arab music in particular, uh, medieval I Iberian uh, music, are very far removed from what the original text actually Actually say. So one of the goals of this volume is to go back to the original text and try to correct some of the myths that have grown up. Um, another thing that I, I've done very openly is there are lots of times where we have an absolutely fantastic little snippet or a text, but how to interpret it is completely wide open. And so I have tried to be very, very open when I translate a text and say, this could mean X, it could mean Y, or it could mean Z, but quite frankly, we don't have enough contextual information to know exactly what this text means, but it could mean any of the following. I know this because one of my grad students read the book and said, I'm very surprised how often you told us that we don't know things, um, but I tried to be very open about that. <laughs> Another thing is that I decided to not to try to work this into a smooth narrative history. So this book is not called a history of Andalusian music, um, pointing to the fact that in fact, what we have are small clusters of texts and iconic iconographic uh, evidence, um, none of which really pull together into a smooth history. So it is more an account of a chain of different interactions. 
And the other goals that I've had in pulling this information together to present, of course, just to get the historical documentation out there, because there are many people working on modern Andalusian musical traditions. And we don't, you know, we're, we're not, unfortunately, when we do that, we're oftentimes not as well informed as we would like to be about the older medieval history that is the origin of this tradition. I also wanted to make sure that I placed the medieval music of Iberia in its Mediterranean context. And that is what I'll be speaking about with my PowerPoint in just a few minutes, um, which I think puts it all in a rather different, uh, different perspective. I also wanted to pay more attention to the role of women in this music, the role of the Jewish communities, the Sephardic Jewish communities, and um, basically to uh, get the documentation out there in a way that if I could satisfy specialists, but also to make it accessible, right? So I have aimed for, <clears throat> I have no idea if I have achieved this, I've aimed for a book that could be read at the undergraduate level and thoroughly understood, but also has enough technical information to answer the questions that more specialized historical musicologists or ethnomusicologists might have. So with that, I will just tell you that as Matthew has already said, the, this part of the project is out, the first, the first volume, which covers the Islamic conquest in 711 to the expulsion of the Moriscos in 1609 to 1614. Um, a supplementary volume called Medieval Arab Music and Musicians it will hopefully be coming out in a few months. And that has detailed annotated translations of medieval texts about music in Arabic. And two of those are very important to people who are involved with the study of Andalusian music. And that is the full, larger, more original um, biography of the singer Zirieb as found in the 11th century text on Muqtabis by Ibn Hayyan, which was the source of the biography that we know, but the biography that we know was heavily bodlerized and changed. So a more accurate portrayal of Zirieb. And second, a translation of the musical treatise Dar uh, at Tiraz, which is the most important text about the origins and spread of the Muasha poetry and song in the medieval Mediterranean. And that, I should say, is both a translation and a rather serious and provocative reinterpretation of the text. Um, so I'll just alert you that that will be coming out in a separate. And the second volume, should I live long enough to do it, <laughs> inshallah, it will take us from the, you know, the 16th century through to the present, uh, trying to pull together details about the individual traditions into a larger picture. And I should say right offhand, there are specialists in each of these traditions who know each individual traditions much better than I will ever know them, you know, whether that be Fez or Tlemcen or Tunis, etc. But we're still lacking a sort of overall picture that, that shows us this, how the spread happened, what the spread is, and what the diversity in these different traditions is. So, um, with that, I will switch over to my PowerPoint, and we will talk mostly about contact in and around the Mediterranean. All right. I, can I get a thumbs up? Everybody who sees this screen? There we go. Okay. So this is, of course, the title of the project that, that Matthew and Vanessa and others are working on, Musical Encounters Across the Strait of Gibraltar. And my... Oops, my title is Medieval Music Across and Around the Western Mediterranean. Let me set the stage by telling you that I am, you know, very openly borrowing a central concept from Brian Katlos, who many of you know as a, um, a historian of medieval Liberia, but also as a prominent figure in Mediterranean studies. And he has developed a term called mutual intelligibility, where he says that despite the specificity and differences between different cultures around the Mediterranean in the medieval period, there were also cultural repertories, there were also social structures that everybody understood and shared for uh, several centuries in the medieval period. 
I'm openly borrowing this and trying to make a case for medieval Mediterranean musical intelligibility. And in this 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about this from a variety of different angles. We're going to start by talking about the spread of musical instruments. And as many of you know, when ethnomusicologists want to say musical instruments in a highfalutin way, we refer to it as the instrumentarium. So let's talk about the medieval Mediterranean instrumentarium. Those of us, you know, if we heard music from late antiquity, we would find it rather alien. These, the an instrumentarium that came from late antiquity was mostly lyres and harps, plucked and strummed lutes, flutes, single and double reed instrument, panpipes, horns, trumpets, and percussion instruments. And it wouldn't sound to us like something that we would recognize as, if you will, classical music, or even as the origins of you know, Western music or minstrel music, primarily because two main instruments or instrument families had not yet arrived. One of these is the spread of al-Oud, which I'm referring to as the Arab lute, although it has older, um, an older history. So some people like to talk about its Persian origins. It could go back even further. We see images of similar instruments and in caves in India that date quite a bit earlier, but it is in its Arab form, al-Oud, that it spreads around the Mediterranean and uh, into Europe. And uh, ancient Middle East, the ancient Near East, had long lutes, and you probably recognize these images from ancient Egypt. And you can see that the sound box is very small, the neck is extremely long, um, and so the sound would have been quite different. The Arab lute is short-necked piriform that is shaped like a pear, and it has a peg box which is angled very sharply and a very large wooden sound box. The Arabic term oud refers to wood and this instrument was probably called al oud because the face of the sound box was made of wood rather than being made of skin. Virtually every European language has a word for lute that derives from the Arabic word al oud once this begins to go around the Mediterranean, we find it replicated in iconographic sources over and over, and it's always instantly recognizable as very similar to the modern Middle Eastern loot. These are images from different places, even Byzantium. And the second musical instrument family that completely changed the music of late antiquity and made it into what we would recognize as medieval music, sounding medieval um, and sort of, and part of our tradition is the idea of bowed string instruments. We are so surrounded by bowed string instruments in the modern period that most people are totally unaware that the ancient civilizations did not know this technique. This seems to have emerged in Central Asia, possibly around modern Uzbekistan only in the eighth century. And from there, it began to spread through the Islamic world to Byzantium, eastward to China, down into Southeast Asia. It began quickly to spread across the world as essentially a global success story. It is, of course, a very basic technique. Um, once you have seen it or heard it, it would be very easy for people to replicate. But this origin point gave birth to all known bowed string instruments, fiddles, viols, rebecs, etc. And there were two different routes around the Mediterranean, North Africa on the one side and Byzantium on the other. This little difficult to see, but is probably the earliest image of a bowed string instrument on European soil. This is from the mid 10th century in Cordoba. And this is actually the capital that sits on top of a pillar. And there are four faces to the capital. It's called Capito de los Musicos, um, two of whom are playing lutes. One is playing this bowed string instrument. You can see held against the chest, the face has been defaced. Um, and the, the fourth uh, person uh, isn't holding an instrument. It looks like it may be a portrayal of a standing female singer. But very quickly, we find portrayals of bowed string instruments in Northern Christian Spain, 
These, these are wonderful works of art. These are the Beatus manuscripts, uh, Mozarabic manuscripts of Northern Spain. Um, Beatus was a monk who wrote a commentary on the apocalypse. And in these commentaries, they were richly illustrated and illuminated. And this is a series of angels. And as you can see, the angels in the lower right-hand corner are playing a stringed, inst a bowed string instrument. Although if you are a violinist or a string instrument player, I think you might look at this with some perplexity, how one could hold the instrument off out into the side in the mid air and play with these enormous bows. My, my personal theory here is that the artist had been told about these instruments, but had not actually seen one. Because if you think about how one would describe it, he has essentially all of the basics there, but at the same time, it's a completely unrealistic portrayal. But within 30 years, we have very realistic portrayals coming out of these same northern Christian monasteries. And from there, these instruments begin to spread throughout, the, throughout Europe. Uh, here is from the Cantigas de Santa Maria. And unlike the lute, they take many different forms. Here is what in Arabic is called the rabab in, in, in Al-Andalus, which becomes the Spanish ravel, French rebec, and English rebec. And if you look at the one on the left, and look at the, the pegboard, and even the body is slightly wasted, that is, has a slightly a slight waist, right? You will see that the modern Moroccan rabab, which is used only and specifically to perform Andalusian music, right, is virtually unchanged from that image. Another route was through uh, Byzantium, where it was got it became known as the lira instead of the rabab. And we find similar instruments um, uh, portrayed also in Sicily. If you look at the top of this, you'll see a very interesting sort of ornament. Um, it's a little hard to tell what that is, but throughout Eastern Europe, Byzantium, the Balkans, and further east, there are similar bowed instruments like this guzla that have horse heads, which may be what that, inst that uh, uh, decoration is. Once these two types of instruments, the Arab lute and the bowed string instrument arrive, they are paired over and over and over again. I have literally dozens and dozens of examples of um, medieval paintings. This is actually from Byzantium, right? And this is from Sicily, uh, the Cantigas de Santa Maria. Over and over and over again, we find the plucked Arab lute with some version of a bowed instrument. And here we find it in modern Morocco as well. So in summary, in the ninth century, the Northern Mediterranean did not possess either the Arab lute or any bowed string instruments. But as these instruments began to spread and disseminate by the 11th century, the new instruments were found across the Mediterranean, around the Mediterranean, and were very important elements in medieval music everywhere for several centuries. So if a minstrel, musician, or singer, or just a traveler was moving around the medieval Mediterranean, the basic instrumentarium of courtly music, of the more art type of music, I'm leaving aside the most folk and rural traditions, would have been familiar, even if the individual musics, that is the melodies or dance steps or things like that were, were different. Just, I won't speak much about this, but to another element that is shared across the medieval Mediterranean is music theory. Both Islamic and European societies were heir to the teachings and writings of music theories from Pythagoras and Ptolemy and their others. All of these music theorists for centuries shared, they were basically Pythagoreans, and that is that they shared the concept of expressing musical intervals through mathematical ratios, such as perfect fourths and perfect fifths, expressed in the ratios of four to three, three to two, etc. And they also shared an, a, a fascinating concept of the music of the spheres with the idea that all moving or vibrating objects created some sort of sound. The ancients believed that since the planets and the stars revolved and could seem to move, that they also must have generated sound. Although they disagreed on whether that sound, that music of the spheres could be perceived by human ears or not. So if we look at the major theorists of the 
sort of medieval period, and I'm only giving examples, there are many more, of course, but we could, you know, have Latin Boethius, the anonymous authors of the Arabic epistles of the Brethren of Purity, the Arab philosopher Al-Kindi, the Persian philosopher Al-Farabi, as I usually put it, you can invite them to dinner and they would argue about details of music theory. They would argue about how to tune the third. They would argue about whether you could or could not hear the music of the spheres, but none of them would actually bring to the table an, an extraordinarily different or new idea that the others had not heard of. That would not begin to happen until the development of polyphony, keyboard instruments, and other developments that took place in the West. In terms of performance practices, <clears throat> these courtly music traditions shared much more than they differed. Um, vocal music was far more important than instrumental music. Music was primarily monophonic, that is all the same melody, or sometimes heterophonic that allowed a certain amount of individual interpretation. There was a very limited amount of primitive organum, that is the predecessor of polyphony, where people would sing in octaves, since male and female voices are essentially un typically an octave apart, or in fifths. And they also worked in modal systems. And many, many of these modal systems were broken down into eight different modes. In addition, we really see only small groups at this period of time, often only one or two singers with one or two instrumentals other than church chant um, and religious traditions where people were trained to sing as a large group at the same time. Interestingly enough, there was a general aversion to grouping wind instruments and string instruments together. In part, this is because many of the wind instruments, if you can imagine things such as trumpets and oboes and things like this, were actually much louder and much more powerful than string instruments. Um, if you are a string instrument player, remember that all of these instruments at this point had gut strings, so their sound was not nearly as bright and as loud as the modern instruments because we use metal wrapped strings. Um, and if you think about it, what is a modern orchestra but about 40 string players trying to fend off five or six wind players? One or two flutes, one or two oboes, a bassoon, and then a handful of brass instruments. So even today, the way we manage to balance our sound is to have 25 violins, 12 violas, 8 or 10 cellos holding off that small group of wind players in the back. So if you are only doing small groups, it is very difficult to group wind and string players together. And of course, there was a large amount of improvisation and uh, paucity, or we have very little documentation of complex pre-composed works. So for several hundred years, a musician could travel around the Mediterranean and almost everything one saw or heard in terms of art music performance would have been recognizable understandable. The instruments would have been the same, basic music theory was the same, performance practices were very similar. This is not to downplay the specificity of individual locations and their traditions, different melodies, different types of lyrics, etc. But one could travel around and, uh, to borrow Matt, Brian Kaplis's uh, phrase, there was essentially a mutual intelligibility. One could understand this music. The divergence when does this begin to break down? Well, Western music begins to explore polyphony and eventually develops harmony. Larger and larger ensembles appear. They mix wind and string instruments. Vocal music lost its supremacy and was more and more overtaken by purely instrumental music. Keyboards emerged, which required new tuning systems. Islamic culture, on the other hand, continued on the path it was on, but going for ever and greater and greater sophistication. In terms of modal theory, they moved from having approximately eight 
different recognizable modes to when we get to the 19th century in Ottoman music um, and Arab music, we have nearly 100 different melodic modes. They developed highly articulated rhythmic theories with dozens of carefully defined rhythms, and they developed tuning systems that subdivided the whole step into smaller and smaller units, microtones. In classical Ottoman music, for example, there are nine divisions within a single whole step, where standard Western music has only one half step. So two half steps make a whole. Instead, we have this very complex system. <clears throat> These and the 800, the Mediterranean lacked the Arab lute and bowed string instruments. By 1100, everybody had entered into this period of what I'm calling musical mutual intelligibility. But by the 15th century, a traveling from the Middle East would have encountered in Europe a very foreign musical world with keyboard instruments, polyphony, harmony, large ensembles, lengthy pre-composed instrumental works, and European travelers would later find Middle Eastern music utterly incomprehensible, out of tune, lacking structure, etc. So that is a contact and encounters seen through three different elements, instruments theory and performance practice. But the most exciting material, quite frankly, I, I think is because we, we like to hear about individuals. We actually like to hear the story of, of uh, musicians and the singers. And as it turns out, in doing this work, I just began to uncover text after text after text that gave us sometimes short, sometimes longer accounts of musicians who traveled basically every direction in the Mediterranean. And this to me was very, very exciting. And we have from the 8th to the 13th century in Iberia and even beyond, as I'll demonstrate, a traffic and trade in musicians in every direction. Now, in this period of time, in the Islamic world, male singers were mostly, but not always, free. Some of them were slaves. But the female singers who were the bearers of this tradition and who constituted easily 80 to 90 percent of the musicians that we know about were mostly, but not always, carefully trained slaves known as PM. Uh, this, this group of people, however, you know, this social class disappeared throughout the Islamic Mediterranean around the 13th century. And discovering more information about these Qiyan was really one of the most exciting parts of this project. Uh, we do not have many images of them. This is from the 13th century, a Libro de Juegos, also known as the Book of Chess. Um, and we see here uh, two women playing chess. And on the far left, we see a woman playing music for them, being the Arab lute. Um, for some reason, people, I, I don't quite understand why, but it, many, many scholars refer to this as two Christian women playing chess. And yet one of the first things that strikes me is that they both have hennaed hands, but they have differently hennaed hands. If you look at the woman on the right, for instance, her entire hand is dyed. If you compare with the skin tone at her neck and the woman on the left, uh, anybody who's been to a Middle Eastern or Sephardic Jewish wedding will, <laughs> will look at this and recognize the henna patterns, including the little dots on the knuckles in the back. I think the artist has been very meticulous in portraying them. So I, I wonder about identifying these as Christian women with a Muslim slave singer. Um, to me, I, they look like more like women, uh, Muslim women, Moorish women of different types. Um, in the Capella Pelatina in uh, Sicily, we have a couple of images of, of female musicians and dancers, which is very rare, uh, which are quite exciting. Here, of course, a woman playing the Arab lute, and here a dancer. Um, and uh, many people refer to this as a scarf dancer, but in fact, uh, I think scholars who have looked, examined it closely talk about the fact that this, these are actually attached to her sleeves and that these are long sleeves and that this actually ties in to a series of sleeve dancing traditions that includes medieval and early modern Iran, among other places. Mm -hmm. I'm going to very quickly, I give these biographies in detail, um, but I'm going to give you five musicians of Cordoba and just to show the different directions that musicians are moving. Sulaim, who learned music from Christians from the north, 
became a, 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 a let's see, Sulaim learned music from Christians from the north. And then his patron bought one of these Qiyan, a slave singer, a female slave singer from Baghdad. And he, we are told that he somehow combined the music from the Christians that he had learned and the music that he learned from this singer from Baghdad. So we have two trajectories meeting in the middle in Cordoba. Hesn ibn Ziyad was originally from North Africa. He traveled to Cordoba. And then for reasons that are very unclear, he fled Cordoba, we are told, and he traveled to the north and, among, and he, he lived among the heathens, the, the Aluj, he lived among the heathens for many years and returned. And the, the, the text, the biographer makes sort of a snide remark saying he returned having earned nothing but the music that he learned there. So apparently he was not a financial success in the north. He returned, was reincorporated uh, incorporated into the court and apparently played this Christian music. So now we have North Africa to Cordoba to the north and back again in a single biography. Sa'ida, a Christian who converted to Islam in Cordoba, learned music in Cordoba, and interestingly enough, traveled from Cordoba to the east, where we are told he was a great success as a musician. Qalam is one of these singing slave girls, one of the Qiyan. She was a Basque captive who was captured in northern Iberia, shipped across the Mediterranean, trained in Medina, and then sold back to the emir in Cordoba. So her trajectory goes from northern Spain across to Medina and back to uh, Cordoba. And of course, the most famous singer of Al-Andalus, Ziryeb, um, is said to have been trained in Baghdad, traveled through Tunis, and gone to Cordoba. So these are just musicians that we know about from biographies in Cordoba. But when we go further to the north, we find Moorish and Jewish musicians, singers and dancers and entertainers of many different sorts populating the courts of the northern Christian realms. This is the most famous image, uh, comes from the Cantigas of Santa Maria in the, in the 13th century. We clearly have a portrayal of a Moorish um, performer on the left and a Christian performer on the right. Here again is one of the interesting things is that uh, Ramon Manuel y Pedal said that this was two minstrels, a Moorish and Christian minstrel performing. But I think he may be mistaken. And the re my reason for thinking that is that this Christian is wearing a sword. And I don't believe that any minstrel of the medieval period would have been allowed to wear a sword and perform that and the very fancy headdress, which is replicated among several other musicians um, in the Cantigas de Santa Maria. I wouldn't call it a crown, but it seems to be bejeweled and to be something that would probably be beyond the financial means of an ordinary musician or minstrel. We don't know the makeup of the musicians of Al Alfonso de Sabio of the 10th, who was the patron of the Cantigas de Maria, the last image we saw, but his son, Sancho IV, when he died, we do know that he had 27 court musicians, 13 Christians, 13 Moros, Moors, and one Jewish musician. So we know that there was almost a complete balance in his court. And to me, it only makes sense to have Moorish uh, or Arabic speaking um, musicians in your court if you are asking them to perform that music. So we can think of this as an indication that there might have been quite a blending, but we don't have to take it from the, the court of Sancho IV of Castile. Virtually every monarch from the 13th century to the mid 15th century in Castile, in Aragon, right? When we, where we have financial records, we find out that they were employing Moorish and Jewish musicians. So the courtly music scene for this two century period, we know for, for, without a doubt to have been populated by Moors and Jews from the South who were in all probability, of course, playing their musical repertory, not the repertory of the Northern Christians. So the amount of, I mean, the number of musical encounters and this, there are dozens and dozens of dozens, individual financial records that offer little snippets, ideas of what is happening. But more interesting is to realize that while we have these Moorish and Jewish jugrares or ministrales um, in performing in these courts, 
we also, by looking at the financial records, and uh, um, uh, Gomez y Mamontane has this wonderful book about music in the Royal House of Aragon in Catalonia, where we see that minstrels from everywhere in Europe, right, from France, Portugal, England, everywhere, as you can see, were interacting, were performing at the same courts as these Moorish and Jewish minstrels. I do not have any account of a Moorish or Jewish minstrel from Spain traveling out to Europe. But we have an enormous amount of documentation of minstrels from elsewhere in Europe coming to Aragon, Catalonia, um, and Castile and Leon, and being in court <clears throat> at the same time as these other musicians. It's hard for me to imagine that if these people are attending the same court, waiting to be on call and you know to, to perform at the same dinners, the same festivities, that they did not have some interactions just on their own. So in the 13th to 15th century and in Aragon in Catalunya, who amazingly enough, the financial records, the royal financial records of the crown in Aragon in Catalunya have survived almost intact. So we have astonishing detail about who is performing, how much they're being paid, how much it costs to repair musical instruments, et cetera. And so these Moorish, Mora, Modejar, Morisco musicians, singers and dancers pop up everywhere, sometimes in family groups, sometimes alone. The women were often the star performers. We don't know whether that was because they were singers. We do know that some of them were also dancers. They are in the royal court. They're in noble households. Astonishingly enough, a large number of Moorish and Jewish musicians are hired by municipalities like the city government of Teruel, the city government of Villa Real. Uh, there's a wonderful study that just takes one century in Villa Real and shows that 50 Moorish and Jewish musicians were on the payroll of the municipal government over the course of one century. We unfortunately don't have a really good idea what they were performing. We know of their existence, we know what instruments they played, we know how much they were paid, how long they were on the payroll, but we don't know exactly what they were performing. <clears throat> we also find them mentioned in accounts of public festivities, in Christian processions, especially Corpus Christi, etc. So this then brings us to the end of the story, which is Morisco music of the 16th century. Moriscos, of course, being the Muslims who were converted forcibly or sometimes voluntarily to uh, Christianity. We are now after, we are post the expulsion of Jews from uh, at least the, you know, the areas of Castile, Leon, Aragon, and Catalonia, and Valencia. They remained in Portugal for a little period longer. Um, this period of time, strangely enough, turns out to be equally rich in terms of musical documentation. Not least because the Christians are constantly pointing their fingers and say, one of the reasons we have to get rid of all these moriscos is that they constantly have parties, sing music, dance, and spend the entire night making music. In 1612, I won't, there are many different accounts of this. In 1612, there is this rather horrifying uh, treatise justifying the ethnic cleansing of the Moriscos, the justified expulsion of the Spanish Moriscos. And one of the things here is a passage, they're overly fond of gatherings and festivities that featured raucous entertainment, storytelling, dancing, singing promenades amidst gardens and fountains, and bestial activities accompanied by all manner of clamor and outcry. And then he goes on, thank heavens, to list 30 different musical instruments that are associated with the Morisco. So we have a very good sense of how they are doing all of this horrifying celebration, uh, you know, festivities, etc. cetera. Um, and so it seems that the, this last little gasp of Arabo Muslim culture, that is the century of the Moriscos, the 16th century leading to the expulsion was equally as musically rich as all of the preceding centuries had been. And that is where I will stop my story. That is where the book also, this volume of the book ends. And um, I have a couple of video snippets that are queued up that we can listen to, but I think maybe the, the best I think would be to handle some questions first. 
and then see if there's a break in the question and answer and either in the middle of the question and answers or at the very end, we can um, play one or two of these uh, snippets, but the links will also be posted. So if we don't get around to discussing them in detail, there are three different examples. One is from modern Morocco, one is from modern Israel, where there is a, an official Isra Israeli Andalusi orchestra. There was one, then there was two. I think it's come back to being only one again. Um, and then the third example is probably the, for modern Arabs, the single most visible um, display or presentation of this culture, and that is Fayrouz singing from her very famous album, Andalusiyat, or Songs of Al-Andalus. So with that, I thank you for your patience. I thank you for the goodness of your listening. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Dwight, for a wonderful presentation. Um, as you say, would you like to handle some questions first before throwing those snippets, those those um, video examples you wanted to show, or do you want to go ahead and, and show? Why, why don't we do one snippet and then um, I, you know, and then we'll do some questions and we can go on to the next if there's a break. Mm -hmm. So I guess the first one I'll show you is um, what might be thought of as the where you could see the most traditional presentation of this music, and that is Morocco where musicians who are performing this tradition, which is referred to in Moroccan Arabic as ala, which literally means the instrumental tradition, tip very often wear traditional clothing. And so it's a smaller ensemble. I can't remember if there are eight or nine musicians. And we can look for a couple of different things. Um, there is a rabab, this instrument that I said is, uh, you know, has remained almost unchanged from medieval Iberia. And they, you will see the lute, you will see violins and violins played vertically, replicating the position of the rabab. So when the violin came into this musical tradition, people said, ah, well, this has a nice bright sound, but continued playing it in that position. And if we, I'll just play, we'll just play a, a minute and a half or two minutes of this. But what you can listen for is the standard musical structure of the muasha. And the muasha typically moves from one melody to a second melody, back to the first melody, and if you continue listening to the second and back and forth between two melodic music um, uh, units. And what we're going to hear, you'll hear sort of a musical introduction. You'll hear the soloist sing the first line, the first verse of the song. The chorus, all of the musicians are also singers. The chorus, the musicians will sing that line again, and then they will replicate it a third time instrumentally. And they will do that with the first verse, the second verse, and then the third verse. And when they're done singing the third verse, that is the cue to move to the second melodic structure. So you should be able to hear a contrast because by the time we hear those three verses, we've heard the same melody nine different times, which is part of why the melodies are so easy to learn. And I think why they're so popular among certain elements of the population. So let me see if I can jump in to... And I asked somebody to give me a thumbs up to make sure that you are hearing the sound. 
So let me perhaps take a few questions now. And then I really would like to show the second clip, which is from the uh, uh, from about 20 years ago, I think, but a wonderful clip from the Israeli Andalusi Orchestra that also demonstrates what some of the improvisation within these concerts is like. Thanks ever so, so much, Dwight, for showing those um, examples. Just really can sort of hear this music and ground it in context. So thank you. Um, and thanks once again for the for the um, presentations. It was wonderful. And congratulations um, for this book, and which was a must have been a monumental amount of work of bringing all those sources together. So thank you. Um, so we have a couple of questions in the chat already. Just as a reminder, if you do have a question, please just indicate in the chat, and then I will invite you to to unmute and ask a question. Or alternatively, you can write the question um, into the chat, and I will read it out for you. So first up, we have Samuel Yano, who's the um, senior researcher on our on our project. So Samuel, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dwight, for such a wonderful talk. Um, so my question relates to a book that you've mentioned at the beginning. I think you mentioned it as part of uh, books that repeat um, ideas without necessarily going back to the sources always, and that is Julian Rivera's La Música de las Cantigas, later, later translated into English. And uh, this was a very polemical book and it's time, uh, not the least because it put forth the idea that all European music originated in Arab music. <laughs> and also because it came up with, I think, an idea that didn't, nobody else had formulated before, which is that of uh, Arab music being polyphonic. So I wonder if you could comment on, on this book and its impact and in particular the question of polyphony and the question of influence, mm -hmm. which I know you've treated in in your publications, but uh, it's an aspect that, uh, you know, I think it's, I'm really interested in and, and I wanted to ask you this question. Well, the second part of the question is the easiest. From my point of view, I simply do not see any real evidence of polyphonic, truly polyphonic music in Arab, medieval Arab music. By truly polyphonic music, I mean that has individual voices that move differently. Um, there, as I pointed out, if you are talking about more what we might call primitive organum, that is people singing in octaves together, or possibly in par parallel fifths or something like that, that's much more possible. And there's another possibility, which we actually I should, perhaps should have pointed out, um, that we heard in this Moroccan clip, and that is where the, the chorus is singing a melody that is here, but it's fairly common for a solo singer to jump up a fourth or a fifth and for sort of dramatic effect, we all like to hear like tenors and sopranos go really high, you know, to go high in, their tes in the tessitura and sort of jump up and sing above. So that's the type of organum that I think we, we could have heard in the Middle Ages. That is a solo singer jumping higher than the instrumentalists or the chorus um, who were singing the response. Other than that, no, I, I, I don't see any. Um, it's interesting to contrast, if you will, um, Ribery Targo was sort of on one side of the Arabist school, and you know, then there are the nationalists. We have the Spanish nationalists who sort of said, well, they were here for 900 years, but they didn't influence our culture at all. They came, they built a few pretty buildings, and then we kicked them out, and that our music is entirely pure. It emerges from liturgical music via the Visigoths, et cetera, et cetera, no influence. And on the Arab side, there's sort of two, the two extremes of the Arabist school are fascinating. One is it all came from the Arabs, right? And it all came directly through Iberia. And through Iberia, it jump-started the European Renaissance. You know, were there no Arabs, there would never have been a Renaissance, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other Arabist point of view, which is sort of interesting, is um, that, you know, Arabs, yes, did bring all of this, but they were merely a conduit of ancient Greek knowledge, all right? So they didn't really have much of an individual. I think all three of these positions, the staunch nationalist position, not believing in musical contact, hybridity, interaction, et cetera, is completely outdated, as is the idea that it all came from the Arabs. Um, in the little presentation I gave, and much more so in the book, I sort of say, rather than seeing this as a flow of influence, right, they cross North Africa up through Iberia, sometimes including Sicily, sometimes not, and then into Europe, we have to think of this as a much more set of interactions, networks going around in various different directions. And there are so many different networks that are at play. Um, there are all of these different minstrels and musicians that are, as I've said, I just gave you, you know, hint 
at the different geographic trajectories. And you also have to realize that music leaves almost no historical traces. We are extraordinarily lucky. You know, if we have a little bit of notation here, if we have a musical instrument, an image of a musical instrument, a biography of a musician or something like that, but it is so easy for a musical idea to jump over whatever cultural boundaries. You don't need to speak the same language. You don't need to be the same religion. You don't need to be the same ethnic group. You listen to someone else's music and you can, you, if you are a musician, you can imitate it immediately. Um, often with changes, of course, but we have to imagine musical culture in general as flowing in many different directions all at once. And so I don't, the, I will, I'll, do one short little anecdote. One of the key um, uh, bellows or fires for this idea that you know Arab music, you know, went on to create the European Renaissance is what, exactly one of the anecdotes that I you know that I'm most interested in demythifying, and that is the siege of Barbastro in 1064. This is a very famous battle for people in Iberian history. And that is this Muslim city is surrounded by Christian forces. The water supply gets cut off and the, the Muslims basically, because they are dying of thirst, surrender to the Christian forces. There's a horrible massacre. And we are told, if you look around, you can read in modern English language scholarship, as well as in France and French and Arabic and Spanish, that 1,500 singing girls were captured and were taken north to France, where they spread across Europe and became, as I said, the jumpstart of the European Renaissance. That is absolutely a wonderful tale, but that's not what the Arabic text says. So the Arabic text says that 1,500 jaria um, were seized. And jaria is a word that can be applied to a singer, but far more often just refers to a servant or slave, both free and, and slaved, enslaved women. So when they say that 1,500 jaria were seized and apportioned out as booty among the Christian leaders, there might have been a couple of singers in that. It's also ridiculous to think of a town the size of Barbastro as supporting 1,500 professional female singers. I mean, it would have been a remarkable thing. And the other thing that is, that is sort of clearly odd about this portrayal is that when Dozi originally read this text in manuscript, he thought he interpreted the reference to the leader of the Christians as being the Pope and this gets expanded and expanded to the point where many scholars refer to this as the first crusade, thinking that the Pope ordered this, but the Pope had no role whatsoever in the siege of Barbastro. The phrase just means the leader of the Christian forces that are besieging the city. So it is a, one of the examples of it. So I, I don't think it all comes from the Arabs. And I think that the, all of these encounters involve interactions, hybridities, uh, give and take, and quite frankly, involve agency. People choose to adopt types of music. It's not like some, you know, irresistible force <laughs> that comes through your, your culture and, and causes your music to change. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you, Samuel, for the question. And um, we have a pile of questions here in the chat, which is great. So we'll start working through these. Um, so Ivan Moody um, is next. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Right, thank you very much for this very rich presentation, um, much of which was familiar to me, a great deal of which was not. Um, you filled in many gaps in my uh, knowledge and understanding of this. Um, just in relation to what you said now, um, I wonder uh, what you think about modern attempts to reconcile uh, Andalusi music with um, uh, Western, how can I put this, Western style medieval music. I'm thinking of, for example, Eduardo Paniagua and Oscar Metiu. Um, how, how do you see that in, in this context? Um, I mean, there are various ways of looking at it, um, but I'd be interested in, in, in hearing your point of view on, the, on these attempts to re-hybridize in some way the, mm -hmm. these, these traditions. Mm 
Well, I, th I think they're very interesting. I do actually have an article that addresses specifically this topic, the recreation of medieval Andalusian music in modern performance. Um, and, and, you know, I, I knew Eduardo Paniagua and several members of his family, uh, Bigone Olavide, Carlos Paniagua, etc. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think the easiest thing to say is we have apples and oranges here. Mm -hmm. In When we do early music in Europe, we basically have some early notation, which is somewhat primitive. So we basically have to bring a lot of our own imagination to how this was performed, how we try to reconstruct performance practices from the Middle Ages. But we do actually have notation. Um, al not, almost none of them, none of them have rhythm. So that's one of the things you have to create rhythm in order to perform these, these early pieces. On the Arab side, we have no medieval notation whatsoever. But we do have something, and that is that we have modern traditions that are descended from this tradition. They are not the same. It's not, not an unchanging flow of culture, but we can look at a, verb, a diverse type, a, a sort of palette of interpretations across the modern Arab world and the Sephardic Jewish world and begin to sort of triangulate back. Right? Um, but if you note, the, the, one of the, the Arab material that we have, the historical documentation is much more biographical, th some theory, et cetera, et cetera. So we have modern practice on the Arab side, medieval notation and recreation of practice on the early music side. So it's an interesting attempt. And each one, each one of these attempts is what I argue in this, this article. Each one of these attempts is extraordinarily different. You know, the Paniagua clan, all of them, whatever, the seven siblings um, and some of their spouses, uh, you know, took this very seriously. And some of them went on to, of course, Begonia and, and Carlos Paniagua lived in, in Tanja, uh, Tangier for a number of years and had a sort of school. And there were collaborations with different Arab and North African musicians in particular. Um, but their early attempts were sort of were, were actually quite fanciful, I would say. Um, so people- I always thought they learned as they went on, certainly. Exactly, absolutely. And I applaud them for that. I mean, it's in this article, I trace their first several, you know, um, albums and you can see the growing understanding. So for example, you know, one of their first albums includes no vocals whatsoever because they didn't have anyone who could sing Arabic. Um, and of course, talking to an Arab about Andalusian music without vocals is like staging an entire opera only instrumentally with no singers. Um, you know, it's, it's just something that cannot be imagined. But as I said, they went on and there, you know, when I wrote that article, which is almost 15 years ago, um, I had contact with 12 different groups from everywhere from the Netherlands to Spain and France that were all doing these recreations. Um, and each one has followed a different path. So I don't think we, we do not have enough knowledge to, to do a historically authentic and accurate portrayal of this music from the Middle Ages. Um, but if this is what allows the music to live and attract people who are interested and give us some idea of its beauty, um, more power to them. Well, I think that was very much part of a trend 15 years ago. And now it's petered out and as you say, gone in different directions. Anyway, mm -hmm. thank you very much for your reply. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Duane. Thank you, Ivan. Um, the next CQ is Sam Barrett, but Sam, I wondered if you would mind if Vanessa Paloma Elbaz quickly jumps in because she has to pick up her, her son from nursery. Uh, is that okay? Would, would you object to that? Thank you, Sam. So Vanessa, over to you. Thank you. Yes, um, duty calls. But I would really like to ask uh, Dwight about, thank you, Dwight, so much. Um, so I recently came across something that said that the first kharja that was found, documented, was actually in Hebrew. And um, I'm interested in knowing, in, in hearing you talk a little bit more about the positionality of the Jewish musicians mm -hmm. in this relationship between the Muslim and the Christian also musical periods at this time. Also, I'm looking at Al Kharizi's um, translation of Musriya Philosophim right now. And I hear that the musical aspects of that did not get translated into Spanish of the original Arabic. So I'm mm -hmm. interested in mm -hmm. understanding what, how, how you can parse out this continuum mm -hmm. in which the Jews were playing a mm -hmm. part. 
All right. Um, so I'll give you just, I'll answer your first question very quickly. And yes, it's true. So Samuel Miklos Stern, who was the person who first opened up, understood that some of these kharjas, the kharjas are the sort of coda, the last lines on a muashah song. And some of these are bilingual. And of course, people who had been reading them in either Arabic script or Hebrew script, they looked just like, you know, gibberish because they didn't fall into the patterns of Hebrew or Arabic. And he began with Hebrew kharjas. Um, so yes, the first to be deciphered. Um, it's not really clear which language the oldest kharjas um, remain are, but uh, yes, so that in, in a technical sense, the first to be deciphered were Hebrew uh, kharjas. Um, the thing that is less interesting to me about kharjas, there are two aspects. And one is we have only a very small number of bilingual harjas, right? It really, we have thousands of muashahat and we have only dozens of these bilingual harjas and they seem to have been very popular for a, a couple of centuries and then they disappear entirely. Once it moves away from Iberia, of course, people couldn't, be, you know, people didn't write harjas in colloquial romance for example, because nobody in the Arabic speaking Middle East knew romance. Um, so some of these were Arabic Hebrew, some were Arab romance, some were Jewish romance, etc. cetera. Um, so they're a fascinating fatan. The other thing is that musically, they do not differ from the rest of the song. In other words, I talked about the binary structure, A, you know, melody A, melody B, A, B, A, B. Well, the khadijas are simply sung to the melody, you know, of that part of the song. So they're musically not distinct. I'm trying to find out more about the Jewish role in Andalusian music was a very exciting aspect of this. Um, but, you know, I want to thank my mentor and guide in this, Edwin Sarusi, since I see that he's here listening. He would be able to tell you much more. He has, a, you know, an absolutely fantastic survey article, a very lengthy survey article that is packed with information. So I have very little to add beyond what is there. Most of the things are things that he had already pointed out. I would point out two things. One, we have documentation of individual musicians. But in, again, knowing a musician, even having some biographical information doesn't tell us what they were playing. And so we can pinpoint Jewish musicians. We can pinpoint Hebrew translations of Arab music theory. Right. This is another, there's a whole network of um, music theory treatises that get translated into Hebrew and circulate through different networks. Some, a couple of the most famous are known to us through their Hebrew translation, the Arabic is gone. Um, so the, the, the key role there. But what is probably the most exciting uh, element of this is, I, I keep saying Andalusian music or Andalusian music, the main genre of this music is a song form called the Moasha, that a term that I've used a couple of times. And Hebrew Moashahat are being composed from the very beginning, right? It's this emerges sometime in the 10th century. We really don't know when. The 11th century is when it really kicks off, or at least that's when we have historically documented Moashahat, you know, tied to individual poets. And Hebrew and Arabic are moving along side by side. And in fact, it seems clear that the Moasha genre was used for religious purposes in Hebrew before it was ever used for religious purposes in Arabic. In other words, it starts as a secular song genre, a lot of wine, beautiful girls, beautiful boys, flowers, trees, bird singing, etc., yearning for love, all that sort of thing. Um, and then it first becomes adapted, it already becomes adapted for religious purposes in the 11th century. And in Arabic, we, we don't seem to have any muashach that is of, of a devotional nature until Ibn Arabi about a century and a half later. Um, so that's a very interesting development. And our Hebrew sources give us some of the most important information about the actual performance of Moashahat. So my, there are several references to Moashahat in Maimonides, et cetera, and other Hebrew sources. So we get a lot of uh, you know, inference. So there's a whole chapter in this book that devoted to Hebrew Moashahat, the origins and, and um, in the later period where I pointed out the sort of the age of the minstrels, Many, many references to Jewish musicians, Jewish dancers, etc. But the same with the Moorish musicians, we literally do not know what they are playing. 
We only know that they are there. Somebody is paying them a salary and having them perform in court. We assume that that is sort of an Andalusian uh, inflected repertory, but we don't know whether they're singing Mwashahet or other types of songs. Is anybody singing in Hebrew or people singing Piyotim? I don't know. Uh, you know, it's we know of their existence and unfortunately very little more. Thank you. So, Sam, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Reynolds. A fascinating talk. I could ask many questions, but I'll, I'll keep to one, which is quite specific. Um, you mentioned several times a sort of dichotomy between organum and polyphony, but of course, I mean, even in the West, that wasn't a simple dichotomy. So I was wondering right. whether there were, there were reports of um, organum at intervals anything other than the fifth and the eighth, for example, the fourth, and whether that mm. led to any descriptions of modified organum or, or not, or whether we, we hear none of this. Well, we, we, it does in the, in the Christian side, but not in the Arabic side. Not in the Arabic. Um, there, there is a very famous reference. This is a um, um, uh, a reference to supposedly organum being taught in Cordoba um, somewhere around the 10th century. But Stevenson had, has demonstrated that the, here's again someone you know, going back to the original, manu, uh, original text, finding something quite um, different than what had been supposed. And that is, he points out that the, you know, this idea that organum was being taught was inserted by the, a, in a later scribe, several centuries later, and in a completely different hand. Um, and so it seems to have been an accrual on the text. And also that the text itself does not say whether organum was being taught in a Muslim or a Christian context. So we, we don't know. Uh, yes, so I, you know, I, I agreed. I mean, there, there are a number of different words for the earliest forms of singing in fifths and, and eighths and then modified organum, uh, adding the fourth and then eventually the move to sort of uh, independent lines that create actual polyphony. Um, the, but uh, no, on the Arabic side, we don't have any of that. Would it be, could we take two or three minutes and show the clip from the Israeli orchestra? Would that be? Yes, um, yeah, if it's, if it's a, a short one, I think that, that'd be good. We still have a number of questions in the chat, but yeah, go. For, okay, go why don't we do that since we, uh, Vanessa raised the issue. So this music moves through many different networks. It moves through Sufi networks. It moves through musicians and travelers and people going on pilgrimage. And of course, through the Sephardic Jewish uh, networks. And so this is uh, an old recording um, um, from a very famous song, and I, I, if we can, I have the text, but we won't be able to see it at the same time. Um, you will see some musicians who are clearly of Middle Eastern background, other musicians who are of Russian background who have been brought in. But what you wanted, what I want you to listen for is the back and forth between instruments and vocals, and then about you know it, it just about a minute or so into this, the main singer will break into an improvisation, which is another key element of this tradition. Oops, sorry about that. And I'm gonna jump it forward. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. 
עד קוד, שמשותייך מהירים. מזולזלת במקרם. Thank you. So to, to me, the most important, what I wanted uh, to show you is that we heard this sort of choral singing version. And then this is a different pr a performance tradition. And they differ from city to city across the, the Arab world, uh, a different tradition that features a solo singer. Um, but whether choral or featuring a solo singer in that way, um, there are these moments and they have different names in different regions. Uh, in Algeria, we called it Instikhbar, where the singer takes some of the, the lyrics of the song and just wanders off and, if you will, explores the melodic mode in these really, I think, overwhelmingly beautiful moments. Thank you, Dwight, for another great example there. Uh, are you happy for us to move through more of the questions? Yes, of course. Good. So the next one we have is from Salvatore Mora. Um, Salvatore, over to you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Hello, uh, Salvatore. Hello, thank you very much, Hello, Dwight, uh, for uh, well, congratulations for the for the publication. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, of course, many questions about uh, the in instrumentarium and the lute and uh, the oud. Uh, but I leave only to a general question, uh, which is um, the following: So, how, how much should we take into account uh, the interaction of popul other populations of North Africa, such as Berbers and uh, Amazigh? Um, mm. And whether or not you, you you found traces of these into the manuscript. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. Unfortunately, our historical documentation for the medieval period is almost entirely focused on the courtly music tradition. We have virtually no idea what is happening outside the royal court and the noble courts, the, the noble houses that are hiring these singers. And the, I always tell people on the Christian side, our problem is that everything in the Middle Ages is basically about liturgy. And Christian church music until around the 12th or 13th century. And on the Arab side, the, you know, the bias is very much toward courtly music. So I, I point out at the beginning, I, the first two chapters of the book, I try to lay out all of the various different ethnic music, eth ethnic groups and, and language group, linguistic groups that are at play here. And, you know, then have to sort of hold up my hands and say, but history has been very unkind to most of these. We know, for example, that the Berbers, the Imazirin, were a long uh, presence in Al Andalus, and yet what music they were playing remains completely hidden from us. So it's, it's quite possible, probable that, you know, all sorts of different interactions took place. What, uh, you know, influence or impact they had would be very difficult to untangle from the, uh, from the medieval material, because our medieval material in the end is extremely limited in that sense. Uh, very rich in portrayal about Medina, Damascus, Baghdad, Cordoba, Seville, a little bit in Granada, and very, very extremely little about music in North Africa in the medieval period. An unsatisfactory answer, but I think the, the, there's nothing else that I can say other than that the sources themselves are unsatisfactory on that count. Thank you, Dwight, and thank you, Salvatore, for the, um, for the question there. So we have another from Amit Abdul. Amit, thank you. Yes, hi. Uh, thank you very much. I really like the idea of uh, mutual intelligibility. And my question is, do we have any maybe accounts from uh, medieval crusaders who encountered music in the Levant? And if we do, does it maybe, or maybe open a trajectory for speaking about uh, cultural exchange, not only through El Andalus and Iberia, but also through, let's say, what later became the Ottoman Empire? Mm -hmm. um, excellent question. Um, unfortunately, during the Crusader period, we have you know, very, very limited sources. I was actually asked to give a lecture at one point for a conference, and but they was focused on the Crusades, but I speak about the, the musical dimensions of the Crusades. And we have a, a tiny, tiny you know, number of um, little references to musical encounters, such as um, a, soldiers on both sides 
during a pause, you know, in the battle, I mean, not, not just like a 15 minute pause, but, you know, a several day pause, entertaining each other by performing music for each other, singing. Um, but, you know, these are probably soldiers. These are not musicians. They're, they're probably probably singing their drinking songs is probably what they're doing. Um, but, they're, you know, singing battle songs or, or drinking songs to each other. Um, and most most of what we sense in the terms of the, um, the musical impact of the Crusades is that the music that the Crusaders brought back with them, and a number of scholars have tried to tease out, sort of say, you know, oh, is this an Arab influence? Is this some Middle Eastern influence or something like that? It's not really easy to do. Um, at our distance and the lack, particularly the lack of notation of these songs. We actually have um, a number of, um, you know, text lyrics, but we don't have the music for them. So then to try to say, well, what, what would have crossed over is very difficult. Of course, uh, Guillaume the Ninth, the, the, the famous first troubadour also went on crusade and he only wrote his first troubadour song around the year 1100 after going on crusade, but he ever never actually got down to the Holy Land. We think he only got as far as, as, the, as the, uh, the, the Byzantine empire and a little bit further south. But um, whether some, just the idea of these secular songs might have come across, don't know. It really, there's so little documentation, it's hard to make a strong case for it. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight, and thank you, Ahmed, for the question. Um, we do have a couple more questions. Would you be happy, Dwight, for us to go slightly over? We were expecting to sort of finish at half. Absolutely. I'm just waking up. It's only 9.30 in the morning. <laughs> it's, if anybody needs to rush off, of course, completely understandable, but I'll take these last two questions. Okay. Uh, so we have one from Amina Bukail. Amina, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, I can't hear. It's, it's quite difficult to hear you. Amina, we appear to have lost her. We'll, mo we'll move over to Leah Stuttard and then hopefully we'll get Amina back to ask her question. And per perhaps Amina can type her, her question into yeah. chat. Amina, it's very difficult to hear you. Could you type your question, please, into the chat? Would that be okay? It's, it's very difficult to hear you. I think she's gone. If we could pass over to Leah, start out please with your question. Hello Leah, how are you? I'm very good. Hello Dwight. Thank you so much for this presentation and I'm very excited about the appearance of your new book. I really can't wait to read it. Yes. Um, I have a question related to improvisation, which is the, the topic of actually my doctoral studies. Uh, you mentioned that that formed part of this sort of musical intelligibility um, and I wondered, so I'm, I'm aware of um, the, the Western medieval, I mean improvisation as a word is a tricky one because it didn't really come about until that, like that right. word doesn't really exist but you mm. know I'm aware of the Western medieval take on this continuum between you know musical creativity the creation of music um, I wondered if uh, your uh, Arabic sources and, and, and Eastern sources uh, represent the acts of musical creation in a way in which we can talk about improvisation as being spontaneous generation how do they, how do they talk about musical creation well, there's, I mean, there are no detailed texts that say, well, let's see. Uh, okay, here's an example of an anecdote about improvisation. Ahmed Tifashi in the 13th century is writing about Andalusian music, and he says that he goes to, a conf, uh, uh, to hear a female singer and that she sang for two hours on one verse of poetry. All right. So you know this. This is this is not a precomposed composition. All right. This is clearly, and he's very impressed with it. Um, he does. He makes comments about vocal techniques. He talks about a, a, a Moroccan singer who put seventy-two hazza shakes or tremors into one breath line. Um, so, but uh, there's not there's not a place that I know of where anybody talks about. Um, 
an improvisation, the creative aspect of improvisation. Um, we do have a, a lengthy, um, in fact, I'm in the process of translating it for the next volume of translated texts. Uh, Al-Farabi has a very lengthy um, uh, section in his great book of music um, that deals with composition. And it is really quite fascinating. Um, so for instance, he breaks melodies into three types. He says, so for him, a note is a full note if it occurs with the begin, the onset of a syllable. So that is a full note. And he says, you can write, you know, songs that have all full notes. That would be syllabic song, um, you know, a syllabic setting. So, but this would be really boring. And then there are um, uh, notes that are empty, which for him are melismatic notes or notes played by the instrument. Anything that doesn't have the onset of a vocal syllable is an empty note. And he goes, but if you did lots of that, we'd never understand the text. So he said, the best thing to do, being a good moderate himself, is to have a mixture of empty and, and full notes, meaning you know, syllabic versus melismatic or instrumental presentation. And then he adds a wonderful comment, and he says, it is the um, point at which the melodic line takes us furthest from natural speech that creates the strongest emotion, the strongest tarab. So for him, these melismatic lines are actually the most emotionally powerful moments as opposed to syllabic setting. And he goes into many other details, but that's about composition, not about you know uh, improvised performance. And again, small anecdotes, but nobody takes it on as a topic. Thank you. That's uh, really interesting. I look forward to reading more of Alpha Rabbi. Could you remind me of the date of Alpha Rabbi? Alpha Rabbi, 10th century. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you, Lewis, for the question there. So Amina has returned. Um, do you want to talk yes. again? Amina? You hear me now? Now you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Good evening, Professor. I'm Amina Bukail from Algeria, Assistant Professor uh, Literary Arabic. I'm very interested uh, about your book. I ho hope uh, see your book in Arabic because here in Algeria, we don't read the meaning in English. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two huge questions for you. The first question uh, for uh, the coexistence between uh, Jewish uh, musician and Muslim uh, uh, musician in uh, Andalus or after. Uh, we have, so for example, here in Algeria, in Andalusian music in Algeria, we have phenomenon. This phenomenon, we have uh, many qasaid in uh, singing by Muslim singer, but uh, the origin from uh, the po Jewish poet. We have, for example, many symbol uh, from Judaism. In the contracts, we have many uh, singer uh, Jews from Algeria sing, but sing uh, uh, mystical or Sufist kasaid. This is phenomenal, phenomenal. It's very interesting. The second question or big question is uh, the continuity, this heritage, because here in Algeria, Algeria, for example, we live with this Andalusian heritage, and our uh, children. We have my children five years, and now she, she is in uh, Andalusian musical uh, scholar to learn this music. So how you evoke this uh, uh, question of continuity, this heritage continuity after fall of Andalus. Thank you very much. And I hope to see your book in Arabic one day. Okay, thank you very much. We are, we are hoping to see a French, tran French translation. Um, so that will be accessible also to some people, more people. Uh, we'd love to see an Arabic translation. Um, so I've been to Algeria a number of times. I've lived in Tlemcen. I studied with you know several of the of the uh, firqas, the the gemaiyas there, and in particular, I always like to thank uh, mm -hmm. the gemaiyas. Uh, 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 I'm uh, from Constantine, the S of ah, Algeria. Ah, from the I'm other from side. I was saying very sorry. So I I haven't been to Constantine. I wish I had, but I know several wonderful scholars who have written about the Constantine tradition, the Malouf tradition shared with, with northern Tunisia, which are sort of separate from al Jazair al Asima and uh, Tlemcen. Um, so the, this book ends in 1609, 1614, and this book is focused almost entirely on Iberia, on the Spanish mm -hmm. peninsula. Mm -hmm. And hopefully, as I said, if, you know, if, if God gives me a long enough life, then I will deal with the, the question of what happens <laughs> after that time. But I fully agree with you. It's absolutely fascinating. The other place that I have worked 
during the troubles in Algeria in the 1990s, when I could not go back to Tlemcen to continue my work, I worked in Paris. And I, 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 there were at that point seven or eight different schools of yes. so Algerians who brought their schools, the Mosalia, that of course is the biggest. At one point, the, their Saturday Andalusian music school had 287 students. Yes. separated into eight different classes. You had to move from first, you know, the beginning class up like that. And then at the very top was the orchestra, you know, the adult orchestra. If you finished, you know, the eighth level, you could go into the, the adult orchestra that played at like the, um, the uh, Arab Institute and different places like that. But these were happening all over the place. There was a Safina, Nassim al-Andalus, um, you know, there were, uh, mm -hmm. there was an, you know, uh, in different parts of, of, of France. So it was very astonishingly impressive the degree to which Algerians had chosen this cultural thread to represent their heritage. Thank you for your questions, mm. Amina. Um, I, sure. Yes, thank you very much. For my, for my second question about uh, coexistence. Yes, so this between is- Between uh, Jewish I music I and uh, and uh, and the competition at the same time, there is competition between uh, Je Jewish musicians and uh, Muslim uh, uh, singers. Right. So I write about this in the context of the medieval period in Iberia. And you're quite right, this is a marvelous story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in, here in the United States, I portray this, you know, this, if you will, this, uh, you know, living together shared tradition, you know, over and over and over again, because in the mm -hmm. United States, for instance, if you say Sephardic music, everybody only thinks of the Ladino side, and they don't know that there is also an Arabic side. Mm -hmm. Um, in 2014, for example, here at UCSB, we had a wonderful conference. Edwin Sarusi was one of the presenters there. It was not only an academic con uh, concert, a co conference, but a public concert and each of the musicians was a scholar, right? Who also worked on these in different places. And one of the things we did is to go back and forth using the same melody, in many cases, singing the Arabic words and the Hebrew words. And we you know, uh, supplemented this with different accounts of field work. And so we tried to give the American public at least, a, you know, a broader uh, understanding of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Amina, for your question. Thank you. Um, so with that question, I'm going to draw this session to a close. I just want to say a couple of words, if I may, before, um, before I do so, before you run off. First of all, thanks ever so much um, to Professor Dwight Reynolds for a wonderful presentation. Um, it's been very courteous to, to, to afford us your time. And congratulations again for a wonderful book. I've managed to get through the introduction so far, um, so I'm hoping to read the rest of it. Um, at some point in the near future. Um, I just wanted to flag up a couple of events as well, um, if I may, upcoming events that we have as part of this series. I've just put in the website address um, where you can find out information about our upcoming events um, and also register. Um, the two that we have coming up in this term, um, on the 31st of March, um, Vanessa Paloma Alba, who's a research associate on our project, um, she'll be launching her new impact um, community project called Sonic Accompaniment to birth in the Jewish Sahara. Um, and in that event, there'll be a range of Cambridge academics and Jewish and Muslim cultural stakeholders, uh, stakeholders from Morocco um, who will be discussing um, women's music, colonialism, birth, fertility, orality, and interfaith relations found in Jewish Sahara and women's songs for labor and birth. And on the 15th of April, um, we have Hisham Aidi from the Columbia University who will be presenting a talk entitled Decolonizing the Kanawa from the Jazz Age to the Afro-Arab Spring. So as I say, you can sign up for both of these events on our website. Um, do please follow us on social media, on Facebook, Twitter, um, and by all means, subscribe to our YouTube channel where you'll be able to get um, videos of all the talks that we've had as part of this series. Um, thank you to everybody for coming. And thanks again um, to Professor Dwight Reynolds for the um, presentation today. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, Dwight. All right, thank you.
but this was a pleasure, yeah. even if I did have to get up very early. I know, thank you for that. <laughs> that was, it's pretty early for you. Yeah, yeah thanks ever so much okay. for agreeing to do that. All right. um, it was great, we've had a great turnout. Um, <coughs> so I, I had loads of questions, I thought they were coming, so I'm, I'm just gonna um, let them keep coming. I'll probably email you with a couple of questions. If all that's right, that's good, that's good, good, good. Um, if that's all right at some point soon. If, if you don't mind, I would like to stay on for a couple minutes and read through the chat. Yes, sure. Because I, I have not. Um, I can, if you wish, save this and send it to you. Oh, that would be wonderful. Yep. Would you do that, please? I yes. Do. Um, I've just saved it now. The question is, where does it save to? Um, showing fine, but just bear with me, Do I don't want to check that mm -hmm. I've got it so I don't. Yeah, here it is. Good. I've got it there. Um, so I'll just take a note and I'll send it to you. Um, to save. Perfect. And thank you, Vanessa. You're, you're muted, something. Vanessa. No. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about the, the Facebook feed. I don't know what happened. Not at all. Maybe you're right. It was something to do with the um, switching host. Because it was so simple when I did it two weeks ago. Yeah. And I, wonder, I was I wonder, close. like you say, you I think I think it can only be you um hosting the event. I'm in order to, to live stream it. We have to find a solution to that because I think that, that, because that's that sounds point. wrong. Yeah. I mean it, it there must be something else that I just didn't there must know be, how yeah, to yeah. yeah. I think Gil maybe we can ask Mustafa if he knows yeah. about that. Yeah, or well, I was uh, thinking Gil as well, because he would be very um Yeah. Very knowledgeable on <laughs> these sorts of things, so he might be one to ask. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah because you, it shouldn't have to be you every time hosting the event. Um, yeah, it just sounds it it sounds like there's some kind of a technical something that because mm -hmm. it it should be. So I'm what I want to do is then take the recording and post it on the Facebook page and I'll I'll so and Matt and Eric put something up um, during the event saying, you know, with the Zoom link. Okay. So hopefully, if people were going to the Facebook, they could have yeah. joined the other way. So we had a very good turnout. Um, yeah, yeah, it was great. Yeah, yeah. That was good. Okay, well, thank you so much. You don't you don't need to save and and send me the chat. I just read through. I didn't really I didn't understand whether people. I thought if people had written out a question that I would then, you know, could email them or something like that. But most people yeah, just no. wrote a question. <laughs> I have a question, right, yes. So. There's only Alex, Alexander Lingus who left a, um, left a comment there. Um, right, okay. Up. So, Vanessa, uh, Samuel, Matthew, the others, Veronica, I guess she's not here, but, you know. Um, so thanks to all of you and um, looking forward to seeing you at some point in time face to face.